Okay, I'd like to welcome everybody to lesson 11 for the book of Acts. Um, we're not going to do too much of a preview, but we're going to cover basically the middle of chapter 5 this week uh, from 12 to 26. It really wasn't a good breaking point, but we felt like trying to get all the way through chapter 5 just wouldn't work. It would be too much. So we're, st- we're going to try to stop at 26. If you remember last week, we covered uh, 1 through 11, but also finished chapter 4. Uh, And as we finished up chapter four, you remember everybody was of one accord uh, and that they were selling things, properties uh, that they needed in order for the money for the church to to take care of all those who were in need. We know that there was thousands and thousands of pilgrims in Jerusalem. A lot of those came to Christ. They had no place to stay. So you see that activity going on. We talked about that. That is not communism. That's not a model for the current church. (laughs) that was needed as the startup of the church. Uh, But this one accord is gonna be repeated as we we move through the chapter uh, uh, today as well. And so as we move through that, you remember chapter 11 starts off with uh, the sad story of Ananias and Spire. We kind of ended that up, you know, are they in heaven or not? It's not our decision. If some believe they are, some believe they're not. Really doesn't make any difference. That's not our decision, Scott, anyway. We'll know when we get there, hopefully, that we would know them. Um, with that, you have, <clears throat> most of the people basically looked at that as God's discipline that was needed at the early church. And all of them said, thank God he doesn't use that today because then we have a church full of morgues, a, morgue, a church of morgues, but bodies. Uh, so uh, I don't think he, he's using that in any shape, fashion today. We talked about is that a sin that leads to death? We, you get some people, yes, some people know us. It's not, un, it's not important. But one thing, you, you, the other side of that is some people will say, well, they just died naturally. Here they are. They puffed themselves up. They will get all this recognition. And then Peter confronts Ananias, and he just dies of a heart attack. Because you know he would, he'd, lose, he'd lose all his self-respect. He'd go from being on the top to the bottom, and maybe they couldn't take it. That's another opinion. Those are all opinions from commentators. You, you take that and do your own work on it. So that's where we left off last week. As we start in the week, this week we start with verse 12. And we're going to start off with really a lot of things that are happening. And we're going to continue to get in, obviously, persecution as well. So with that, I'll turn it over to Annette. Verses 12 through 16. And through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. Yet none of the rest dared join them, but the people esteemed them highly. And believers were increasingly added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women, so that they brought the sick out into the streets and laid them on beds and couches, that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might fall on some of them. Also, a multitude gathered from the surrounding cities to Jerusalem, bringing sick people and those who were tormented by unclean spirits, and they were all healed. So the first thing I will see is what some people might point to that is a a contradiction. So they're saying here in verse 13, it says, yet none of the rest dared to join them. But the people esteemed them highly, so nobody dared join, and and we're guessing that's going back to knowing what happened to Sapphira and Ananias. And then in verse 14, it says, and believers were increasingly added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women. So my question is, is it contradictory? Verse 13 says no one dared to join them. And then in verse 14, it said, but believers were increasingly added to the Lord. Do we have a contradiction here, a little mistake in the Bible, you think? Hmm. Are you sure? Not a mistake. Not a mistake, but I don't know what's going on. (laughs) It's definitely not a mistake. Charlie? Um, Well, it says on Solomon's porch. Isn't that somewhere in the temple area? It is. So they might not have wanted to have joined them in public. But they certainly weren't afraid to join them, you know, incognito. That's a really good point. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, we will. I will say that most of the things we read would point back um, that, and I know I would be. Let, 
put yourself, if you are part of the church and you witness Ananias and then his wife, Sapphira, a few hours later, drop dead because of lying to the Holy Spirit. What's that going to do to you? It's going to do one of two things. It, it would only do one thing. Don't, don't lie to the Spirit. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Either it would cause you to leave <clears throat> because you were not seriously committed and you didn't want to take on that kind of responsibility, or it would make you very committed to not lie and not do the things wrong and live as very closely you could to the Bible, um, to the way the church was, the, the word was being laid out. And so that what we see is that um, there were no, that all of the, what they call them looky loose is a word I heard here before, like all the people kind of, kind of rubbernecking or coming by to see what all this about or, or trying to get in on the excitement, but they, those people kind of gravitated away from the church. It was only those truly committed, those fully ready to recognize Jesus Christ as Messiah, crucified and wrote, risen, and there to save them from their, their sins as the only way to be to God. It, it was those people, very committed people, that were joining in big numbers. And it's very nice to know, and it's reassuring that even though this shock of, of, of Ananias and Sapphira occurred, it really did not impact the growth of the church. Um, it was, um, you know, it very well could have, you know, if it wasn't God, if it was a plan of somebody else and it wasn't a plan of God, it could have backfired and just the church fell apart. But um, the act uh, being perfect through God brought very committed, only the very committed uh, were joining the numbers. So that it was helpful and that helped the church continue to grow. And we're going to see it didn't last a whole long time, but it did last for a while. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting just to add to this is that most commentators said this was an act of purification for the church, a pure church, a church pure in, in policy. So that could have been it as well. So we don't, we really don't know. So moving on to the next question. What was the population's opinion, opinion of the apostles in, in general? I think the, the population right there, it says that they were, uh, uh, they were, uh, how did it word it? Esteemed them highly. Esteemed them highly. All right. Exactly. But, I mean, Jesus said that the, the road to destruction is broad. And, and easy and the road to salvation is the gay is narrow and it's hard so the overall population you know was probably varied in all kind of directions but the people right around them i think they were esteemed highly I mean, yeah and i think that's that's totally accurate uh th that doesn't go into this but we get it in other areas uh, of the previous uh verses read you know, even the Sanhedrin and the Pharisees and the high priests were astonished by the knowledge that Peter and John demonstrated. And the signs of yeah, and the and the signs and wonders. So they were very much held to a high esteem, even by probably some of the members of the Sanhedrin, uh, and much less the public. So the, the contradiction here is they were held in high esteem. But if I went into a local church today that had 200 people sitting in the pews and I say, uh, don't lie to the Holy Spirit of God, you're going to die right now. There's some people going to think about that and say, hey, this church ain't for me. I came in. I like the music. I like the good message. But, hey, I, I, ain't, I ain't into this dying business. <laughs> so uh, some people were leaning towards that as well. So uh, the point here is I think the population as a whole really respected all the apostles, their knowledge, uh, their eyewitness, their commitment. And I think that's what he's trying to point out here is that that's really what we saw. They were held in very high esteem, even though some chose not to follow them. And the, well, most of the Jewish and the Sanhedrin chose not to follow them because they didn't want to change. Their heart was, was stone, stone cold. So the next question, again, this is kind of a silly thing, but these things catch my mind. I'm like, well, why is that there? Why do you think that Luke included that people were brought on beds and couches? Mm 
<laughs> so this was an this is so again, it's really astounding how almost every word in the scripture is there for a reason and gives us a fuller meaning. And that's why you will never get done studying the Bible. You will never, I mean, it's why it's, it's just, it's a magical book. It, it's forever growing. But anyway, the, the, by designating that there were beds and couches, it tells us something about the economic status of those flocking to the uh, apostles and that there was no, distinction of, with economic status on those seeking them. So a bed would have been a common or, a, 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 you know, would have been like a little mat that they could roll up and drive around is what they called beds. They were just small, not really structures of furniture at all. It was more like a mat. And that would be for your poor people. Mm -hmm. Only richer people would have couches. And that would be more of a structured uh, lounge bed, something that they would be brought out on up off the ground. And so uh, somebody very astute pointed out that this showed us that um, the church didn't recognize economic status. Um, healing was not based on economic status. This was open to all who would have faith in God. And it's just a good point for us to see. Right. And, and as that said, I'm, you're blown away when you run across a verse like that and say, what in the world is that verse doing in the middle of the scripture? So what if they bought them in beds and couches? That just blows me away that that's thrown in there and your first reaction says, so, why put that trivia stuff in such so important? And it's there for a reason. We have seven comment several commentators that says every word of the Bible is there for a reason, for a purpose. You just have to do the research to figure out what is there sometimes, but sometimes it's not obvious. Well, it's so easy just to skim over it and not get anything out of it. Right. I would just think it's a descriptive term. That's what at first I was thinking, but I thought, well, it's kind of weird that they differentiate. That's what I love about this stuff. It's amazing. I'm excited. Yeah, and this is not a question, but I'm throwing it in unless it tells me we have it later on. <laughs> it says, uh, bring in the people and those who were tormented by unclean yes. spirits. Okay. okay. Uh, so what came up out of there as I was doing the, the study and the research is we think of unclean spirits as people demon possessed, you know, really bad people who are almost crazy. We grew up, drove out their evil spirits. And, and the real meaning of that is people who are sick physically and other people who are admit sick spiritually. So the unclean spirit is basically spiritual illness not necessarily physical illness at all. And so many of them lean towards an unclean spirit is that person who is constantly sinning, is doing sins and love their sin. They're full of the unclean spirit. So that, that really, because when I first read this, I said, what, they were casting out demons out of these people? They were all demon possessed? And that's not really where most commentators take it. So I'm taking that up just for your own knowledge and your own research. With that, this last question on this section of, of the verse is, was the shadow of Peter healing? No. Okay. It says the, that at least the shadow of Peter passing by, passing might fall on some of them. Well, yeah, but that was a scene. That was a scene God created to use his power. Okay. That was so just I, a point in time to where he could use his power. So I don't know whether Peter had the power through his shadow to heal people. Uh, by the answer may be absolutely no, but we're not told. And this scripture doesn't say that's what he did. So you can't read this scripture and say, by Peter's shadow, they were healed. We know the woman touching Jesus' garments was healed, right? Was his garment holy? No. A lot of people think yes. <laughs> and I, I have different opinion there. I'm not going there right now. The point of both of these that we need to get across is not so much was it his shadow or Jesus's garment. It was the faith of the people having that level of faith that Peter's shadow could heal them. That was a true faith issue. Well, the way I read this is just a little bit different uh, as I read it. I think that's the desperation of the people trying to have their loved ones healed. 
that there it was not probably possible for everybody to get close up by Peter. And so they were like, okay, I just, I just need to get them close enough. Maybe his shadow will fall. And that's what they were hoping for is kind of how I read it. I don't read it that it doesn't state that people were healed less the shadow of Peter passing by fell on them. It's like the family was anxious to get them out in the streets close to where Peter might sh- shadow might fall on them. Yeah. And so I don't think yeah, that I, they were using the shadowing. That's that's how I read it. I don't, I can't, I'm just throwing that out there as another thought because. Yeah. And let, let me add to that so I can close the, the end of this puzzle. Uh, the Oriental people, many of the or- Oriental people during this time period, and it was known by these people as well, they believed that the shadow of a person had great power. So that was a belief system that maybe was not in the Jewish culture, but it was a belief system that was in many other areas of the world. As a matter of fact, if a famous person was coming down the street, people would run to get their children to put them in the shadow of a famous person, hoping that the shadow of that person would bear goodness on the person that went through that. So this was a common practice to some people, not necessarily in Jerusalem, so it was well known. So I, I do think that's part of it. And I think it really showed uh, the faith they had and the fact that it was a large crowd. I think all those things work together. I, I, want, I want to say something else. You yeah. remember, remember Jesus promised that they would do many wonders, even greater than he. And I believe that this was a point in time to where it was all predestined. Jesus knew that this was going to come about and knew he was going to, God was going to bestow his power at that time. Those who came, came in faith. They did come in faith. Okay. But it was a moment in time where God could use this moment and use his, Jesus could use his apostle to uh, uh, make this happen and make this worthy for glory to the father. Let me know if I'm going to step on something. Uh, The other thing uh, we need to keep in mind uh, and again, I'm giving you the, the comments of a lot of different commentators uh, and Bible uh, experts. Some of them or have different opinions, but I kind of lean towards this. God empowered the apostles. The miracles and wonders were not done by the apostles. They're done by Jesus Christ sitting in heaven through his apostles. Well, you see up here and through the hands of the apostles. apostles. I love that verse, through the hands of the apostles. So let's not get too embedded in the fact that these healing churches, these people that come in and the preacher says a bunch of humble jumbo and one person gets healed out of the group. uh, They'll go back to this scripture as saying that these are powers today. I don't think these powers exist today. Do we have miracles and signs and wonders today? Absolutely. They're all over the place. Just open your eyes and see it. I'm not saying that, but we don't have 12 apostles that are out spreading the word of Christ and the gospel that has never been preached before. And why was all this needed? There was no written word. I said, was no New Testament. How did they go to people and get people to believe them? The only word of God was the Old Testament. Now it prophesies Jesus. But it, it, there, there was no New Testament writing. And so when you look at these people preaching of one accord with nothing written down yet, these miracle wonders, and in my opinion, and this is supported by a lot of commentators, was absolutely necessary in the early part of the church in order to get the believers to have confidence and faith in the apostles. Remember, they were eyewitnesses. They were only going to be here for so long. And God used them and use signs and wonders in order to convert people. Remember, signs and wonders don't do it. You might be amazed. You might be astonished. You might be esteemed, highly esteemed the people doing it. But yeah, but the fact is, that's not what saves you. To only believe in Jesus Christ and him died on the cross for us and taking and accepting him as your Lord and your Savior. Not the signs and wonders, but they help collaborate what the apostles were teaching. So let's go verses 17 through 21. Then the high priest rose up and all those who were with him 
which is the sect of the Sadducees, and they were filled with indignation and laid their hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison. But at night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, go stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. And when they entered that, they entered the temple early in the morning and taught. But the high priest and those with him came and called the council together and all the elders of the children of Israel and sent to the prison to have them brought. So why, let's go back to the very beginning. Why are the Sadducees filled with indignation? What is indignation? It's probably a combination of anger and jealousy. <laughs> that's a good one. I think that's a really good thing. It's a, but, and I also put, I also will put anger, jealousy, and a little bit of entitlement. When I think somebody's being a little bit indignant, it's, uh, I think the entitlement for whatever reason that they, you know, I have my rights, I'm this or that. Um, and I think you could add rage in there as well. Yeah, anger, Ooh, rage. A, a, anger and rage is part of it. So what's interesting is, we'll go back to the Sadducees. And if you remember, the Sadducees did not believe in um, resurrection. That was their big fight with the Pharisees. So that's why the Pharisees and they were always going head to head. They did not believe in resurrection and they did not believe in heavenly beings. Therefore, they did not believe in angels. And so these apostles um, uh, were preaching a, a, a truth, a philosophy that they did not believe in and they were gaining popularity. So that was the cause for their indignation. Um, they, uh, the, anybody that was just fed up with this movement or something new and just wanted the status quo because they were very comfortable where they were within the status quo, they were indignant. And I do like that is a mixture of indignation is a mixture of jealousy and anger, rage, and possibly entitlement. My next question is then, what's a common prison? Again, that's one of those things. Where does that mean something? What's a common prison? Why don't they just say thrown in prison? And uh, what a common prison is, just, just a little small tidbit, is it is the normal everyday prison for the average you know, inmate. Um, it, at first, I thought it meant that they were all put together in one cell. They may have been. They may not have been. A common prison, in the common prison, generally they were shackled and the doors were locked and they were guarded. And uh, although this scripture doesn't specifically say that they were shackled, Dave had found a good point that perhaps they wouldn't be because um, it was against the law, uh, Roman law, for anyone to be shackled that had not been sentenced. So they're in jail for holding. They haven't been sentenced. Um, obviously, in the last last week, we saw that they, they couldn't find any grounds to keep them. Um, but anyway, they, they, they're not sentenced. So there's a lot of things were wrong more than just them taking them for no reason. This is just a kind of a mute point here. But when I first read this, and it, it, it spurred this question. So it's a very simple answer or no answer like most things, how many apostles were arrested? Was it just Peter and Paul? I mean, Peter and John? Remember, they were arrested the first time. This is the second arrest. So how many were arrested? And most people agree that all the apostles were arrested. All of them were thrown in jail. If it was Peter and John, it would have stated that, specifically who they were. But by using the term, the apostles were put in prison, it's all the apostles. Now, there's some that says, maybe that's not all 12. Uh, you can go back and forth on that. But I think as you read that, they laid hands on the apostles, not on a, not on a few of them, not on a specific one, like Peter or John, and they put them in common prison. So we, we think it's all apostles were thrown in, in prison for preaching Christ, not just uh, the one. Now, ironically, as we were talking earlier, and I throw this out, is that several commentators just says, don't tell me our God doesn't have a sense of humor. 
Here you have Sadducees who don't believe in angels, and you have an angel that released the people in prison that they put in prison. To preach. <laughs> to preach. A truth. They told them not to. A tr truth that they don't believe in. <laughs> so if that's not ironical that he used that method, uh, it's a little humorous when you think about it. But next question. Um, that's yours. Oh, is it? Mm -hmm. So why did God send the apostles to preach and not the angel? The angel came and released him, had all these powers, and told him to go preach the word of light, which I'm going to talk about here in just a second, right? It's not later on, is it? Mm. Okay, right. So why not just the angel go? Well, if he was just going to send an angel to do the preaching, why would he even mess with the apostles? You know, <laughs> it's their job. That's exactly. what they were trained to do. Yeah, it's ex exactly right. How many times do you recall angels getting up and preaching the gospel? They don't do that. They don't do that. No. God leaves to men what men need to do and angels what angels need to do. The fact is, is Christ didn't die on the cross for the angels. He died on the cross for us human beings. And so God is using human beings to proclaim the gospel, not his divine people that are in heaven with him. So uh, it's very clear that this is God's purpose is to use humans. And the angel is that catalyst to be able to provide them to do that. Now it says, go tell all the people speak. Uh, the words of this life. Some translations of this life, life is capitalized. All right. So what, what does it mean, this words of life? What's the meaning of that? I think they're talking about the gospel, that the life that's in Christ. Yep. Being born again, being a child of God with eternal life. Eternal life. That, that's exactly right. The, the life here is eternal life through believing in Christ and preaching the gospel. That's how it's all been subbed up. You remember Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father through me. Right. And John basically repeats over and over in his epistles. It's the word of life. Uh, so life is usually categorized as really the eternal life of believing in Christ. So that's usually how the, all of them put this. So when it says go preach life, it's really them go preach the gospel. That's just simply what it says. Remember, again, I repeat this because this is in this is in my head so strong. They did not have anything written. These were 12 apostles preaching the word of God with out of their own mouth, really it's the Holy Spirit. And they were all of one accord. They didn't contradict. Give me 12 ministers in any denomination that can speak in one accord and don't contradict themselves. Hey, what happened? So this in itself is a miracle. It just blows me away that they were able to do that. Okay, now. So um, the next question is, with persecution comes purity. Okay. And we know the church was going through persecution. And we know that there was a little event with Ananias and Sapphira which I think was part of purification. We talked about that last week. Um, was purity of the church perfect then? Nothing's perfected until you get to heaven as far as I'm concerned. I think as far as God's concerned, you're right on. I think that that's exactly right. No, not at all was it a perfect purity. Only Christ was perfect purity. Um, the thing to remember, again, there was some purification that occurred with the event with Ananias and Sapphira. And we don't know for certain that that's the only event like this. There could have been other sifting of, of wheat and chaff or other kind of crucible heatings and, and, and skinning off um, the dredges and things. There could have been more purification going on. This was one that was recorded. But what, again, just to kind of recap, there's not a whole lot to go into. Of course, it wasn't perfect, because as Bobby said, not, no church will be perfect. No people will be perfect or person until, until they have finished their journey and they end at heaven uh, with the master, with the father. Um, but 
What we do see, again, the clues that we have, they were on one accord without a written word, and that this church went through a process and was very pure um, at its time. At, at its beginnings, it was very pure. Again, as we, we continue on in the New Testament, we're going to see, even on the Acts, we're going to see that, that this perfection became corrupted very easily as the church spread, and, and we're still dealing with that corruption of the word today. Yeah. And this comment was made by commentators, and it's probably true. Was the early church pure? Yes. Was it perfect? No. Was it perfectly pure? No. But it was the purest form of the church that we've ever had as our history and our starting point. Their point was there's been no purer church than the first church. We've all grown in all different ways, and our churches have come less pure. And guess what? We don't grow in believers coming like we used to. The churches want to teach an easy believism. They want to teach a soft way of in, entering. The, these people were preaching the gospel. I mean, this was hard stuff. This wasn't, you know, a good, a feel good message. And they were growing by magnitudes. And so they, they say that the, the purity of this church shows by its growth. So a pure a church is to its scripture, to God, to Christ the more it has growing believers. Uh, not how big the van is, not how many people are sitting in the congregation, not how big the building is, not how many television shows is being broadcast from it. All that is nice to kind of attract people, but it doesn't make real believers unless the church is teaching a pure message. So I thought that was hey, interesting to just throw in. Hey, Dave. Yeah. You know, I think about, when these people went to the synagogues, the Jews with the right heart, they did like I did, I think, for a long time. Just sat in church, couldn't wait to get out, did, knew that that guy up there doing whatever ceremonies they did, didn't care about them, and they did their little thing and they left. When they met these apostles, they felt the love of them. They gave them something and they weren't, they didn't heap burdens on them. They didn't ask them for money. It was a totally different thing that they were seeing in the apostles. Right. Yeah, good, good point. point. Yeah. Very, Very good, good. point. So the last question in this verse uh, is why do you think God allowed their release here? Because they were being they got out of prison several times, but later permitting such tragic deaths. And we've been through this before on our study. We know what happened to every one of the apostles. I'm not going to go through that in, in detail. They were all martyred except for John who died of a natural life. From being crucified upside down to being beheaded, to being dragged through streets, to being stoned, to being thrown off uh, uh, cliffs, to be beaten with a, uh, a bat until they died. So why do you think he got the apostles out of all this trouble right now, but then later on, uh, allow them to be martyred. Well, I think he got them out of this because they had much, much work to do in the spreading of the gospel in the kingdom. And then uh, when their work was done, they uh, displayed the, the, the ultimate witness you know by you know by being martyred you know uh so i think their martyrdom was their ultimate witness you know to me you know dying for christ you know being uh stoned and all that stuff you mentioned but i mean if if he hadn't let them out if they hadn't been released here they wouldn't have they wouldn't have done all the work of the kingdom that they did and I think that's very true, Robert. There's one other point somebody threw in that I have mixed feelings about it, but God allowed the persecu persecution early, but got them out of it. And the reason why some of this persecution occurred was, one number one, is they were able to preach the gospel to the Sanhedrin and to the Jews. They wouldn't have had any other opportunity unless persecution started to do that. So it actually opened the doors, persecution did. The other side persecution did 
it actually drove them to a point where they needed to leave Jerusalem. Remember, Jesus said, preach not only in Jerusalem, but in Judea and in Samaria and all ends of the earth. You can't do that sitting in the synagogue, in the temple, sitting in Jerusalem. So they were there to start with because he told them to start there, but he told them to get out of there and go. So part of the commentators were saying part of this persecution was God's way of pushing them out of Jerusalem and getting them to go to the rest of the world. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. We can ask God one day. And, and just to build on what Robert said that is really good about it being the ultimate witness, um, if we go back to the case for Easter and Lee Strobel, and one of the overriding or overwhelming truths that he could not escape or answer away was how did these men who had walked with Christ, who witnessed that Christ had been resurrected, how could they possibly go to these horrible martyred deaths, no, no, proclaiming true. Christ while they're being burned, proclaiming Christ while they're at the gallow, proclaiming Christ while they're being stoned, um, at, without, without, that was the ultimate witness to us. Their witness was the witness to us to let us know who would go through this kind of treatment unless they believed what they were teaching was absolute truth. And so and it really it. gives it yeah. power. And you said something yeah. else that struck a chord, and I think it's very true. Uh, during this time period, uh, we know that the 12 apostles were with Christ. We also know that 500 brothers nine counting sisters and children, witness Christ's resurrection. And we also know that James and all the apostles, included Paul as well. So we know there were a lot of eyewitnesses, in, but as the church grew and the years moved, those eyewitnesses would be di dying off. And you know what would happen is they died off and would go to generation to generation. The generations start forgetting what their ancestors did. It's just natural. I start looking at our our grandchildren today, they forget my father's generation. They do. They don't even think about World War I or World War II. And that's what would happen. But by the apostles being martyred and going through what they went through, it substantiates the realness of this to all generations to come, even 2,000 years later. So I think it drives that point. And I think that's kind of what you were leaning to, Robert. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. You know, Dave, I was thinking about how they threw these, these people in jail and God sent an angel and let them out. And I think about the times they wanted to lay hands on Jesus and they couldn't touch him till it was time. Right. And they couldn't have touched these apostles till it was time. That's exactly God right. was not going to let that happen. Right. I agree with you. Okay. Dave is, the, I mean, just to, I just want to throw it out and go on. Dave is the one that brought out and got really passionate about how in the world would Peter and John have been able to witness to the Sanhedrin had they not been arrested? It all God took something like that and gave them a mouthpiece in front of this council. It's it's phenomenal. All right, the last section here. We might get through it tonight. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> that short answer, so hopefully we'll be okay. But when the officers came and did not find them in prison, they returned and reported, saying, "Indeed, we found the prison shut securely." and the guards standing outside before the doors. But, what we, but when we opened them, we found no one inside. Now, when the high priest, the captain of the temple, and the chief priest heard these things, they wondered what the outcome would be. So one came and told them, saying, Look, these men who you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Then the captain went with the officers and brought them without violence, note that, for they feared the people, lest they should be stunned. So really amusing that they go pick them up. They're not there. They figured they probably, well, we'll get into that. So first question. First question is, uh, what did it mean they wondered what the outcome would be? Why is that worded that way? What is your thoughts? Well, if you go back, how many times did uh, even the Pharisees back with Jesus, they couldn't deny he was doing miracles. 
they couldn't deny what he was saying. And they were, they didn't know what to do. So they came up with killing him. They thought that was the only way to hush him. Well, you have the same situation here. These people, these apostles are bringing in thousands of converts and the Sanhedrin is using, losing their leverage, you're losing their power and they're, they feel powerless over what's happening. So it's really, what it really means is they didn't know what to do. They're they don't know how to stop this from growing. They know telling them don't do it doesn't do it. If they if they kill them all, that's a big question as well. We get into the last question. We'll talk about that in just a second. So this really is they wonder what the outcome would be. Is they have no clue. They're totally perplexed at how do we stop this movement, and it keeps growing. Even though we throw them in prison, even though we persecute them, it just it keeps growing by bounds and leaps. So nothing seems to be stopping them. And we tell them don't do it, and they're right back in our face doing it the next morning. So. The next question, this is one that I put in here because I, I'm looking to hear what, what you have to say about it. It's, it's, been, it's been weighing heavy on me about faith and sharing faith. And I just wonder what kind of things do you think trigger faith? When I read when I read the Bible, when I when I read God's word, there are certain areas in the Bible that trigger my faith. Okay. And when I see people worshiping in church and in their homes and like we're doing now, that triggers my faith. Okay, good. Any you know, other people people that are humble and the the actions of others. You know, when you respect somebody, you want to know what they know. And if you respect someone and they tell you about God, it, you know, that kind of thing triggers faith. Mm -hmm. One of the things, you know. I think, I mean, and, and my son is one that has, has felt very strongly that um, the way to lead people to Christ is to first develop uh, uh, relationships. Um, which is the missionary in Puerto Rico that started a church there who was in Sweden before said, you couldn't ever walk up to somebody and hand them a track and say, would you like to talk about God? It was not going to happen. And I think the same in, in, in China and um, act, creative access locations. You can't just walk up and, and say, I need to tell you about Jesus usually and have it go anywhere. Usually what they have to do is they build relationships and friendships um, and, and I just feel this, this nation is just getting me overwhelmed. I have to keep focused on God and not let it overwhelm me, but I'm worried. I have this urgency to share faith with people. I'm not worried. I mean, of course, this is something new for me because my whole life, I probably would have been worried about being, in, I mean, I'm horrified to, to see what the scripture says about me being ashamed of God or caring more about people than than God, but I mean, I'm, I've been there. I'm sorry, I have to admit it. Um, but now I don't really care that people think I'm weird or a Jesus freak or whatever they want to say. I mean, I have Dave and I have y'all. I mean, I don't, I, I can lose people, but I don't know. I, I just feel this burden of sharing faith without, when we have a good enough relationship that I don't run them away and I never hear from them again, and turn them off. You know, and so I was just, um, if anybody wants to help me with that, we can talk later. We don't need to do it all on here, but. Well, and I think there's some other things. Go ahead. I think it's through your testimony. People can relate to your testimony and your testimony shares your faith and, and helps other people have faith. Yeah, I think that's true, Dee. There, there's so many things. I don't think there's one answer. All these are good answers. Uh, I think Bobby said the word, the word of God. If you read the word of God and you understand and you look and do the research, if it can't, if it can't promote faith that prophecy was fulfilled, it's impossible. It, it couldn't have been written by anybody else but God. You have that in itself. And the other thing I think it's pretty obvious in this particular era of time, faith was being brought up by signs and miracles. People were coming to faith by the apostles' abilities to do signs and wonders and miracles. And God used that to bring people to faith. We have the written word now. 
we had what they didn't have. And so I think the word is important. I think our deeds and how we how we come across to people is important. But Annette knows we, we struggle. How can we get to more people? You know, how can we get to more people? I mean, we go through and we publish this and we get it out on the internet and we get a few hits here and there. But this, this is not leading people to Christ, what we're doing. We're basically discipling all of you. So we are all better to lead other people to Christ. I'm not worried about leading you to Christ. I'm worried about discipling you and you discipling me. So we're better disciples to lead other people to Christ. And I can't find any other body to bring in. So even on, on family, I struggle with. I don't know where some of them are. Um, and so it, that's what it's is a burden on me. It yeah. is heavy on me with all the stuff going on. It's, yeah. Partic it's particularly with so many signs of end times, the pandemic and the forced vaccination and the, all the things that are happening right now, we're talking about there's some guy saying that we're going to go into food shortages and you're not going to be able to buy anything. Grocery stores are going to be empty. It's going to be chaos. We're going into a time that we, we, we think is the great tribulation, but we ain't there yet. And so but no. Christ said, these things are going to happen. So be aware that they're happening. So there's really, I think what she's saying, I don't want to put words in her mouth. There's a sense of urgency to reach more people because I think the time's running out. Mm -hmm. We're obviously closer today than we were yesterday, right? And we'll be closer tomorrow to the tribulation than we were today. So how do we get to more people? Uh, I, Dave, uh, there's, there's a church on every corner, and I know all of them aren't good. I've watched our little church pastors beat themselves up because the church wasn't growing. We're not outreaching. We're this, we're that. But I, they said only a few were going to go. You and Annette are doing a fantastic job. I, 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 I'm so glad I'm in this ministry. You're, the people, Bobby, Robert, I've seen all these people influence people. The word is getting out there, I think, to everybody that wants to hear it. You know, I, that's just me. I, I, I don't, I've never, and maybe I'm wrong. I've never beat myself up that I'm not doing enough. I, and I know when I push it, it comes out wrong. And I've done that on more than one occasion because I really, my heart was right, but my timing wasn't right. And, and if, if I had. That's the question for me. That's the question. Go, 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 go ahead. And then I'm sorry. No, I, I got, I'll get, no, you stated my, that's my. Dilemma, exactly as you stated it. When is the timing right? You know, when yeah. can well, I let, do this and not it be wrong timing? Yeah, let, let me say, Dennis, I don't think never we're wrong. Beating ourselves it's never wrong at all. I don't think that's what we feel. I don't feel that. Uh, right. I just, oh. I wonder what we can do. Oh. So go ahead, Bob. No, it, you guys have, have been remarkable just hanging in there and. And I know you've, you've both Amen. been through battles and it's been tough trials come and go, but you've, you've hung in there. You're, you're fighting a good fight. And remember this, the, the road is narrow and few choose to go this way. So if you keep that in mind and, and you have your scriptures set to where as you could go, when you're troubled, I have about four or five scriptures I can go to, to whereas I'm, I'm, I'm loose again. I'm, I'm loosened up. I'm, I'm feeling the spirit again. Okay. And it's a feel thing at that time because we're fragile. We're going to be fragile till we get to heaven. But if we keep fighting a good fight and we're not going to lose because God's not going to give up on us and he's not going to allow anybody to snatch us up. Right. right. I, I agree. Bob, I'm going to say this and I say this with all candor. All we can do is what we're doing I don't Amen. feel bad that I'm not reaching more people because I know this is my opinion and y'all can have your own opinion. My opinion is until God touches the heart of someone Amen. and makes him or her receptive, then we have an opportunity. What we're doing comes across. If that person's heart is stoned, you might as well be talking to the wall. They don't hear it. Look at the Pharisees, the Sadducees. Look at the high priest. Look at what they're witnessing. And they still wouldn't believe. And you think I'm going to be able to witness to somebody like that and say they're going to believe? No. 
It's a work of God, I know that, but it doesn't stop us from doing what we need to do, and that is getting more people trained, getting us a trained along the way. And you know, I, I hope one day we'll have four or five or six, seven Bible studies where you know we're providing material to and we we grow. Uh, like Mary Kay Pyramid. <laughs> Amway, huh? Amway. <laughs> okay, I think I have the next question. I'm going to move on because we're going to run out of time. So, where should so signs and wonders are happening? Miracles are happening. Where should our focus be when it comes to signs and wonders? Well, not on the signs and wonders, you know. Uh, our focus should always be on Christ and his gospel. Uh, you know, signs and wonders to me are lanyap. I don't know if that was a good word to use. That's a good word. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, I mean, look, if God allows me to walk on water tomorrow, well, so be it. I'll praise him. But if I don't walk on water, I still have Jesus. And that's what counts, you know. So um, what we need to do is, as you said, do not focus on the signs and wonders. We need, to so we need to focus on the fruits of the signs and wonders. What is happening because of this? Who is getting credit because of this? How are lives being changed because of this? And if, if God is not getting the glory and God is not getting the credit and people's lives are not being changed for the better, then we need to worry about the sign and the wonder. It's exactly as you said, our focus needs to completely be on God and not on the, the fancy thing that happened. And if somebody is waiting for miracles and signs before they accept Christ as their Savior, good luck. Mm -hmm. That's the wicked, that, yeah, the wicked generation looking that, for a sign. Right. It is. I totally agree. With that, the last question, we're right up against time as always. Uh, why does Luke state they feared the people least they should be stoned? <coughs> Let me well, go ahead. The, the, they were afraid the people would stone them for taking or messing with the apostles. Yeah, that's exactly right. So they, they did fear being stoned. And if the apostles would have said, hey guys, Get away from here. We're not going to prison. We're not going back with you. They could be excited a, a riot. And there was enough supporters there that probably would have taken them in stone. So if the apostles wanted to take that tactic, they could have, and they didn't. They went peacefully. Why? Because they were still being witnesses to the Sanhedrin. We get to that. But the other thing that some commentators pointed out, and I'm going to read a verse to you. I think it needs to stick, stick in here. It's actually Proverbs 29, 25. I don't know what uh, translation this is, but it basically says, the fear of man bring a snare, but he who trusts in the Lord shall be exalted. So it's a, it's a kind of an odd thing. You're to fear the Lord, and by fearing the Lord and trusting the Lord, you don't have any fear for man. But the people that fear man or in deep trouble. Mm -hmm. So you have the most religious of the religious groups. They're fearing the people more than they're fearing God. That's what this is basically saying. These people are fearing people. I'm talking about the Sadducees, the high priests. They're, they're fearing the people. They ought to be fearing God, and they're not. And so it's odd that this is a proverb, and they use this proverb to say, here's the issue. When you're fearing a man, what a man is doing to you, your fear is in the wrong place. Your fear should be of God, your trust in God, and you'll be fine. You won't have to deal with the fears of the world. So that's how they position this, and I thought it was an interesting way to look at it. You, you know, Dave, I thought about something. When they, the angel didn't tell him, now, I'm letting you out of here, now get out of here before they kill you. He told right. him, go preach in the synagogue. And, that's right. and so when they stayed there and preached in the synagogue, that said, he, that told those, these people, we're not afraid of you, you know? And, and, and it's, it's, I just find that amazing. And when, when they captured Jesus and, was, um, and put him on the cross, the apostles were scared to death. Here, they weren't scared at all. Right. You know, exactly. just, <laughs> so, so you see the big transition because the apostles aren't scared of men, but the Pharisees and Sadducees are scared of men. Right. 
That's that's the that's the irony. The irony of all this. That's what they're trying to point out. It shouldn't be the Sadducees and Pharisees ought to be fearing God right now because they're seeing all this stuff going on. No, it has to be from God. Yet they're fearing men and what will happen to them, what the men might do. Anyway, any last comments or closing things? We're right up against time. As always, enjoyed it. We always run over a little bit, but want to leave it open for questions. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, this means the world to us yeah. this, that God gave us this opportunity. We love this. Yeah. So, yeah, well, let's close in okay. prayer and we'll get her going. Our dear Heavenly Father, we come to you at the close of the scripture, and, and my heart is, my heart is, I'm excited about the things that you can do through us. I pray, dear God, that. Again, we've been praying for the nation, and I just pray that you will use us to reach a very needy world. Help us not to hold back. Help us to fear um, people's losing their life, their, their ability to be with you, more than we fear rejection or ridicule or, or what persecution. So I just pray that you would give us strength, give us opportunities. And it's a dangerous thing for, to pray for, um, for opportunities because I believe you will provide them, and I pray that we would... Um, recognize them and step forward in faith and your power and spread the word of, of your goodness and build the kingdom. Please be with us as we go through this week, our prayer request. We love you. We thank you. You're an amazing and wonderful God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.